with Mike DeCourcy. Next segment here. And uh, Mike is uh, always gracious enough to join our show at least once a year. We try not to bug the heck out of him. He is a busy man. Uh, with Fox Sports, BTN studio analyst, sporting news, uh, uh, on and on. He has been a contributor to uh, basketball for a long time and uh, one of the best at, at it, to say the least. All right, I want to talk to Mike. You know, Purdue is is – not really the flavor of the month because it's been really good this year and, and last year, but to talk about, let's start with the Boilermakers and just your impressions, uh, an impressive win over Michigan, a Michigan team that's in, in very desperate straits. Uh, and yet Purdue's got to go to that uh, nemesis Rutgers uh, on, on Sunday, a team that's beaten them the last three times they've been to Piscataway. It's a hard place to play. Uh, and, yeah. and Rutgers is a hard team to play against. Uh, that's something that, that Steve Peichel has cultivated, uh, making it uh, difficult to play against them is is where they begin the game. And then they try to progress from there on offense. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I, I think that one of the best ways to combat that is to make yourself hard to play against. Yeah. And for Purdue, that's not, you know, their style is not totally gritty, let's be sandpaper, but they they'll guard you obviously, and 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 Zach's ability in the middle uh, makes makes it hard to go against them and to get the shots you ordinarily want to get. Uh, I, I do think that there is a greater disparity at at their at their core at their base. There's a greater disparity between this Purdue team and this Rutgers team yeah. than has existed for a while. Uh, this this Rutgers team is in development. Uh, it's a shame for Cliff Amore because yeah. uh, he, he's having a great year and they struggle to score around him sometimes. Uh, sometimes they struggle to get them, him the ball. And when he when they're able to get him the ball in good situations, he's as good a finisher as there is in college basketball. Uh, it'll be it, it'll be an interesting matchup between Cliff and, and Zach. Certainly, at, at the very least, the, the game will be appealing for that reason. Yeah, Sunday uh, uh, matinee, so to speak, in, in in New Jersey. When you look at Purdue and 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 Zach, even you were around when Ralph Sampson won back to back uh, college players of the year. Help me put the right words about what Zach Eady is, and, and really in the history of college basketball, not just this season. He's been unbelievable. Well, he has, and and uh, you know, as as long as he remains healthy. Yeah, that's really the only component, the only the variable between now and, and March. Uh, he will be the national player of the year. I think R.J. Davis having a great year at Carolina, uh, but I don't think he's rising to, to the level of what Zach is doing. And think I, I think this is the full list of the Oscar Robertson trophy, which is the oldest trophy other than the sporting news player of the year. So yeah. I'm going to so I'm going to use the Oscar Robertson trophy because it goes back to Oscar. Uh, the the list of players who've won multiple players of the year award with with the with the Oscar Robertson Trophy, which is presented by the United States Basketball Writers Association, I believe is Oscar, Jerry Lucas, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Pete Maravich, Bill Walton, and Ralph Sampson. I believe yeah. that's the entire list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't need. I don't even know if I need to expound beyond that. Yeah. So put your to put your achievement on the level with those gentlemen is amazing. And I, I do, one of the things that I talked about on BTN was that there's a tendency because of the, the Zach being seven foot four, 285, 290, whatever the number <laughs> is. Uh, it, it, according to Matt, he, it, it depends on how many, uh, Burgers he had there the, the day before. Sushi, 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 sushi. Yes, sushi, yeah. Sushi, yes. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, it, it, because of his size, people think it's easy. Yeah. And I just challenge them to look around college basketball. I don't want to single anybody but, out, but there are other 7'4 players out there. There are 7'5 players out there who aren't a fraction of what Zach is. It's not just being tall. It's all the work that goes into being more dynamic, so dynamic now relative to where he was his first three years of college basketball that now the NBA finally looks at him and says, wait a second, we might be able to do something with this guy. 
And Jonathan Gavoni, the, the terrific draft analyst for ESPN, puts him in the lottery now. I don't think anybody thought that that no, was a possibility yeah. before. Uh, so that go and that all goes to the work he's done. I mean, because although he's he's a you know he's a great finisher, uh, and he's a great uh, uh, he, he he's a terrific free throw shooter, and he can protect the rim. That was all pretty much in place a year ago. What wasn't in place was the work he did on his body to become more mobile, better able to defend on the perimeter. Not a problem in screen defense, but at times a weapon. Uh, all of those things were from the considerable work he put into the 2023 offseason, and it's reflected on the floor night after night. You've covered this for a long time. There really haven't been many stories more. I mean, there have been a lot of great college basketball stories over the years, but this is really a unique one. I mean, just where he's come from. Matt Painter talks about you know, he's a he's a youthful basketball player in terms of basketball life. He's only played, what, six, seven years or whatever that is. Put that in perspective as well. I mean, it is still an amazing story that Purdue fans probably shouldn't or, or college basketball fans shouldn't take for granted. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to necessarily say that he has to have the same career. But since we've already talked to him in the same sense of <laughs> and Pistol and Kareem, I think that we can point out that there's a similarity in his basketball youth to Hakeem Olajuwon. Uh, When Hakeem came over uh, from Nigeria to the United States, he played relatively little basketball. There's also a similarity to a degree to Joel Embiid, uh, who who played some uh, in Africa before he moved here. And then when he got to Florida, where he played in high school, prep school, um, he hadn't played much and he didn't make an immediate impact. Uh, at his prep school. And then he comes to KU uh, and is one of the best players in the country before he gets hurt. Um, so there, I think there's a similarity there too. Uh, it, it beca- it, now, I don't, I, I, where his size makes a difference is like, there's not a lot of point guards out there that just picked up the game when they yeah. were 15, you know? So yeah. obviously the people that we're talking about are big guys, uh, but they also are big guys. The other thing they have in common they were athletes, just didn't happen to be playing basketball. Uh, they played a lot, uh, both uh, Embiid and, and Hakeem played a lot of soccer before they came to the United States. Uh, Hakeem played a lot of it. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, we know Zach's history, baseball player, a little bit of hockey, and then all of a sudden decides to devote himself uh, to playing uh, basketball, and the results are spectacular. Yeah, they have been absolutely that. All right, uh, your bracket this week, uh, Houston on the rise. Purdue still looks like your overall number one seed. Any scenario, uh, there's always scenarios where Purdue doesn't, isn't a number one seed. I get, I get that. But the path for Purdue looks uh, looks to be Indianapolis, Detroit, and then hopefully if you're a Purdue fan, Arizona. But to talk about that and just some of the teams, you know, North Carolina's obviously made a huge jump or made a jump. Uh, teams to really watch out for. Kansas, that loss to West Virginia was quite startling. But to talk about some of the teams that you're looking at that uh, uh, may be laying in, laying in the weeds a little bit as we enter uh, February. Yeah, I think, you know, I think first of all uh... – for Purdue, uh, what they have to avoid is what Kansas has done more than once, which is lose to teams on the road that aren't NCAA contenders. I, I, I There is a scenario in which uh, UCF, Central Florida, can create an NCAA tournament path for itself. It's still a ways away. That's not possible for West Virginia. West Virginia's only path to the NCAA tournament is to win the Big 12 automatic. Uh, so... That and and for Purdue, you know, their opponent is whoever's on the court that night in themselves. Yeah. Uh, because if if they do well in the Big Ten as they have over the first relative the first half of Big Ten play, if they do the same things, give or take, and probably give, because I think they're they, you know they don't play in Nebraska on the road and Northwestern on the road. If they do the same things over the second half. The only team that's out there that is a threat to them being where they want to be, uh, specifically Detroit, because they're almost certain to wind up in Indianapolis. They're going yes. to be a one or a two because you look at the three line. I could, I'm working on tomorrow's bracket. I can barely find threes. 
Yeah. They're just not there. The, the line between one and two is significant. The line between two and three is precipitous. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so they'll 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 get Indy, but if they want Detroit too, KU is probably the biggest threat. Uh, it's the only team out there that would half want to be there. They it, uh, they might you know they might not make any difference for them to be there or Houston. Uh, so if if Purdue gets its one, it's probably going to Detroit. So that's a good thing. And so it really, like I said, it really just has to focus on itself and and the opponent on that given night. Uh, UConn is probably a one, but they're going to want to be in Boston very badly because it's just a few hours drive. Uh, the, the, the one in the West, probably Houston at this point. The competition for that is probably Arizona. Uh, so again, there's really, Purdue's really in a good position geographically right now uh, because they're going, you know, if, if they get the one, and, and it's up to them in large part, mm -hmm. if they get it, then they'll probably get it where they want it, which would be the Midwest. Yeah, I think of that uh, you're a logical guy. That makes sense in a sometimes illogical situation, to say the least. But uh, I, I think that's that's true. All right, let's talk a little bit about the psyche of Purdue and and, and what's going on. You know, obviously the the 16 seed defeat. I think it appears uh, watching it on a day to day basis that Purdue has dealt with that well. Matt Painters keep the focus on living in the present. Uh, which is a good idea. Uh, and Matt Painter's a smart guy. And, and, and I think you would, you and I both would agree, pretty excellent basketball oh. coach. But talk about that, though, and just that, that uh, you know, Virginia got it done, I know, and, and back, in, back in 2019, over Purdue's dead body, so to speak, but uh, they got it done. What do you see from that standpoint? And as Purdue, as Purdue works its way to that, uh, well, what I think will be the third weekend in March when this thing all starts, how do you do? How, how, how do you approach that? Or do you see Purdue approaching this the right way, or they just got to take care of business as they go? You know, I, I one of the things when I went to their game against Xavier, uh, yeah. which was first or second game of the year, I sensed a little bit of man, it's a long way to march, yeah. and I didn't see in them the the typical Purdue. Uh, there, there felt like uh, that that. Oh, we're going to get these guys. We're at home. Um, and man, it, you know, do we really want to put it all out there? And, and this is not a conscious thing. It's always a subconscious thing. But sure. I've covered college athletics for 40 years. I've seen it in teams time after time. And it's not something I'm condemning. It's something that's natural. It's just yeah. how you manage it. Yeah. And so what the, the best thing for them at, at that point was at that point in the year was, oh, now we got to go to Maui. Well, go ahead and take that attitude on the floor against the teams they had to play out there. Yeah. You're going home one and two with a win over Chaminade or whatever. Yeah. You got to play. And they did. And they, and you saw right there, oh, wow, this at their best, they're really something. And then the same uh, in the Arizona game here in Indy, uh, they, they at their best, they, uh, they really can bring it. And I think that there have been moments so far this season where a little bit of that creeped in and, or maybe just the other team in particular, Northwestern Nebraska, understanding what beating Purdue could do for them yeah. brought everything they had, you know, they, they moved the whole living room onto the floor. You know, they had brought everything they had and Purdue was like, Hey, we're just here to hoop. You know, it's like, and that's not, you know, that's not going to get them through in against the team that sees them as a ticket. Recently, the Indiana game, I never, I knew that wasn't going to happen because of what happened a year ago. So you knew they were going to bring their best effort. But I, th I thought the Iowa game was a breakthrough because Iowa is a team that came into that game no less ambitious than Northwestern and Nebraska, but more desperate because Nebraska already had some good wins under their belt. Uh, uh, Northwestern had the Dayton win. Iowa has a good team and no big wins. And so that was a huge game for them. And as well, Iowa is a team that can get you playing basketball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, up and down, having fun, we're all good. And all of a sudden they throw in six threes in the final five minutes and you're and you lose. And Purdue wasn't having any of that. I thought that was a real statement of intent by the Boilers that, OK, yeah, we let a little a few go early in the year, but that's not going to happen now. Somebody's going to have to be A, really good, and B, 
at their absolute best in this league, they're going to, and, and they're going to obviously have to be at home. I don't think the Boilers are going to lose at Mackey. So yeah. I, I, I think those three things all have to be in place for, for the Boilers to lose at full strength. And let, you know, let's hope that, that, that this team gets to play the whole year at full strength, because uh, the last thing that we would want to see after what's happened in the last couple of years is them not getting to take their best shot at erasing that. Yeah, no question. Braden Smith has been really good. Uh, guard play that where there's been a lot, obviously a lot of talk about the, the being one year older for Fletcher lawyer and Braden Smith to talk about those guys and, uh, and what they mean, obviously, you know, more than anyone that uh, the NCA really comes down. A lot of it comes down to great guard play. Purdue seems to have enough of that, but how do you view that at this point? They have more than enough, Alan, when you got a guy like miles yeah. Colvin that can't get on the floor. <laughs> And I think Miles's entry has been good for Lance, uh, for Lance Jones, and for Fletcher Lawyer. I think his his presence is is a motivator because they know, like that if that if Miles got his shot, he might not ever <laughs> give it back. Uh, he's really talented. We saw in the Xavier game, the Alabama game, what he was capable of delivering uh, when it was necessary to help them win. I'm not convinced that he might not yet still, even at, with the team at full strength, be needed at a moment and deliver. I think he's terrific. Uh, Braden is just a year older. He was already terrific. He was already an outstanding point guard in the league. He's just a year older, a little bit smarter from the experiences that he went through last year. Uh, I, he's he's probably a better shooter. Uh, but I think, I think Fletcher has gained strength, he's gained confidence, and he's gained that motivation of knowing – Look, I, I'm the guy because I've been here, but the guy behind me can really play. Uh, so I've got to I've got to be at my best. And I think that's helped him a lot to to be the player he's been as a sophomore. Yeah, Miles Colvin came off against Michigan nine points in a hurry. Uh, just uh, nine points in seven minutes. He can show us he can do that. And that's an excellent point. That I hadn't really thought of that, that whole motivation factor. With Lance, and Lance Jones has been phenomenal. That has made a big difference as well. Okay, last question for you. In a, with Scott, or excuse me, Northwestern Illinois on Wednesday night. The beauty of college basketball. I don't know how much you got it, were able to see that game, but just wow. what a, a great game. And it ended up probably working best for Purdue because Northwestern wins that game and puts another loss in Illinois' ledger. But talk about just that and uh, and just the, the the phenomenal. Even Purdue in the court storming situations, it's still been great great theater for the other team a lot of times. But talk about just the, the state of college basketball. And I thought one of the best games I've seen in a long time was, was Wednesday night, uh, Northwestern's overtime win over Illinois. It was a phenomenal game, Alan. Just wonderful basketball. And a game that might not have been played a year ago. I think, the, the, although I do believe the talent overall in college basketball is down. You see that reflected in the mock drafts uh, that four of the first five are in, in, in uh, say, uh, USA Today's I looked at. The four of the first five were international or G League players. Uh, that's not great for college basketball. Uh, you want the best players to be in NCAA, and most years they are. This year, it's just not as as elite. But what college basketball's done, and I don't, I don't think it was because of that. But the 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 change in the charge rule has made the game so much more attractive. There's not, there's all, all that flopping is gone. All that diving in front of driving players who who are totally committed to the drive. Uh, and you dive in at the last second and and then all of a sudden they're supposed to somehow stop their progress when they were clearly moving forward and clearly moving toward going into the air. Uh, all of that's gone. So guys can get to the rim now. You see dunks, you see layups, uh, you see action around the rim. I think it, I think the game itself is so much more attractive. And all of that was on display in the in the uh, Illinois Northwestern game. And it's a there's a bit of a rivalry there. They've had a nice rivalry over the years. Not one of the best in the Big Ten, but a one that pops up as a cool little rivalry. Uh, and and that you saw some just terrific players, uh, especially Boo Booey. Uh, yeah. What he brought down the stretch was amazing. You know, uh, I had we had this thing on Big Ten basketball and beyond 
on Sunday where we did this uh, guard draft. Who are the best guards in the Big Ten? And it went back and forth. And I got the first pick and I picked Boo. Uh, and then Ray Fell took uh, Jameer Young and, uh, and it went from there. And after Boo's performance, especially in overtime, on Thursday night, I tweeted at Rayfell. I said, I think I won the guard draft tonight. Yeah. And then he brought up, yeah, well, Jameer just made a buzzer yeah. beat in Iowa. So are you sure about that? I'm still sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> what Boo did uh, against Illinois was phenomenal. The the ability to get to the rim, the ability to make the jump shots, uh, really entertaining. Marcus Damask, a great yeah. player. Uh, you know, I, 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 I didn't ever really think Illinois was going to hang in the league race. Uh, to the to the extent that it'll be Purdue versus Wisconsin, I I always thought Illinois would be in the picture, but not in the in the in the uh, on the you know on the top two in the medal stand. Thought they might be the bronze kind of you yeah. know down a little bit toward the ground. Uh, but uh, uh, I I think that that game was also a good statement for what Illinois can do in a tough environment uh, against a team that is gets really hot. Uh, I thought Illinois guarded them well for the most part, but it was just hard to keep track of you know, Ty Berry making all those threes and, and Boo himself kind of defies almost every game plan when he's on. Yeah, absolutely amazing basketball. A lot to talk about. Mike, thanks so much for your time. I mean, it's always insightful. You always bring something to the table that uh, I might not have pondered, uh, and I appreciate that so much. We'll look forward to seeing your work uh, that bracketology thing is a, is a head on a swivel moment every week for you. I get that. We appreciate that. Of course, your great work on, on BTN with with uh, some really great guys, Ray Davis, Bruce Weber, uh, the Purdue contingent, even Rob Hummel from time to time. Uh, pretty good co company from the Purdue world uh, that uh, are fun to talk some basketball. So have a great rest of your week. Thanks so much for your time. And we'll be back for our next segment with Board of T Trustees Chair Mike Berghoff. And uh, we'll talk a little for Purdue sports and what the future may hold. Uh, that'd be another conversation for Mike down, Mike DeCourcy down the road. Is, where is all this going? But we'll get to that later. Take care, Mike. Thanks so much.